This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode, where my guest is Dr. Neil Bell, bryologist at the Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh, and author of The Hidden World of Mosses, which takes a look into the minute and fascinating world of bryophytes. If you've ever wanted to know how these plants live and reproduce, whether you can cultivate moss indoors or outdoors, the environmental and habitat value of mosses and how they are affected by the moon, then listen on. So moss actually is a, a plant, it's a green plant, so similar to other green plants you're more familiar with, like ferns and flowering plants and conifers. And that's in contrast to, for instance, uh, lichens or fungi, which which aren't plants at all. They're actually more closely related to, to us and to animals than they are to, to real plants. But mosses are are plants. They're just uh, a very different group of, of green plants. So most mosses will have leaves, which are only a single layer of cells thick. So that's why they have that sort of translucent appearance that you, you tend to see when you look at a clump of moss. And their relationship with water is maybe a bit different to the relationship that most of the plants have with water. So they tend to be absorbing water and nutrients over their entire surface rather than through through roots in the soil. And they're fluctuating in terms of their hydration status according to the availability of, of water in the environment. So this different relationship that they have with water is really the main thing which makes moss a bit different from other plants. And it also explains why they're, they tend to be much smaller than other plants, because if you're relying on the immediate external environment and absorbing water over your entire surface and you're not using roots, you can't really afford to be very big because otherwise you wouldn't be able to get water and nutrients into the, the centre of the plant. But fundamentally, mosses are just a different group of plants. And it's interesting because they do obviously behave differently to a lot of the plants that gardeners are familiar with. And I thought it'd be interesting, actually, if you could just kind of briefly touch on how they reproduce, because I think that's probably a bit of a mystery yeah. to some people as well. So it's always something which is, is quite difficult to explain. The reason that's difficult, I think, is because we're so used to the way that flowering plants reproduce, which is actually quite complicated when you look at it at the cellular level. So mosses and, and other bryophytes, so we'll get onto this later, but when I'm talking about mosses in the book, I'm really talking about mosses, liverworts and hornworts. This is a group called the bryophytes. But all the bryophytes have this method of living, which we call informally alternating generations. And that basically means there's two different forms of the moss plant, one of which is attached to the other. And the thing you're seeing when you're seeing a green leafy moss is actually what we call the gametophyte. It's a technical term, but it basically means that, that the cells inside the plant only have a, a single set of chromosomes. Unlike in flowering plants, when you're looking at the green leafy part of the plant, that part of the, the plant has two sets of chromosomes. And there is a part of the plant, of, of the moss plant, which has two sets of chromosomes, like flowering plants, but that looks very different from the green leafy part. That's what we call the sporophyte. So the way that mosses reproduce is you have a green plant with stems and leaves. Sometimes you get separate male and female ones. Sometimes you get male and female parts together on the same plant. And these green plants will produce gametes. So that's egg cells, which are the female parts, and then motile gametes, which are the sperm, which are the male gametes. And the male gametes will swim through a film of water and fertilize the eggs, either on the, the same plant or on, on a different plant. And that then produces the diploid zygote, which then develops into the sporophyte, which is the second generation of the plant. So this sporophyte, it doesn't actually look green and leafy. It looks like a sort of a big sporangium, a big kind of blob on a sort of stick, if you like. And inside that sporangium, you then get a process called meiosis taking place, which splits up these cells that are two sets of chromosomes into cells that just have a single set of chromosomes again. And these are spores. So the sporophyte is producing spores, which are then dispersed. So unlike flowering plants, where the seed is the, the method of dispersal in mosses and other bryophytes, it's the spore that is the dispersal mechanism. So it sounds quite complicated and it's quite difficult to explain, but that's really just because we're so used to the way that flowering plants reproduce. Yeah, so it's a bit different, but it's actually not as complicated as it might initially seem. Does that make them a bit like ferns, how they reproduce? Yeah, yeah. So, so ferns are similar in that respect. They're sort of in between ferns. So ferns also have a, 
sort of alternating generations, but you may have seen a fern gametophyte. It actually looks a bit like a liverwort. It's sort of a, mm. a tiny kind of thalloid thing. And that's the equivalent of the moss, in effect. That's a part of the life cycle, which is doing the same thing as the, the green leafy moss gametophyte does. But in ferns, you get that same process you get in mosses. You get egg cells and sperm cells, which are produced, and then they come together and produce the, the sporophyte. But in ferns, the sporophyte is the big green leafy thing that you see, just as it is in flowering plants. It's sort of intermediate. So ferns are like mosses in the sense that they have a, a very visible multicellular gametophyte and a, a visible multicellular sporophyte, but they're like flowering plants in that it's a sporophyte, which is the prominent dominant stage of the life cycle, whereas in mosses, it's the gametophyte, which is the prominent dominant stage of the life cycle. So talking about the sporophytes and actually thinking about all the small parts of mosses, um, the details of them, which you can see in your book, thanks to the amazing photography in the book, is intriguing. And I think that if we could look at them in as much detail as we can actually see plants up close, we would appreciate them so much more than maybe we do. So I wondered actually, how would you encourage people to better see mosses and to explore what they look like in detail? Yeah, no, that's a very good point. It's, it's a point which I'm always trying to get across people is that when you discover mosses, not the bryophytes, it's almost like you're discovering a sort of hidden level of biodiversity that you weren't previously aware of before, because it's there all the time, it's around us, but we just can't quite pay attention to it because it's, it's just a little smaller than we're used to looking at. But it is actually visible. So it really is just a case of looking a bit more closely. So most bryologists, most people who study mosses will walk around all the time with a small magnifying glass called a hand lens and we'll often have that hanging around our necks and after a while you sort of get used to using that almost as an extension of yourself so every time you see a clump of moss you'll be taking your hand lens out and just looking a bit more closely at it if you're young if you're sort of below 40 and a really good eyesight you can probably actually see quite a lot of the details of mosses and and other bryophytes just by kind of getting your face down into them and looking closely they're not invisible they're just a little bit smaller than are necessary to grab our attention unless we make the effort. So it's just knowing they're there and making the effort to just look a little bit more closely. And then when you do that, you'll discover this amazing, visible world of diversity that you previously perhaps weren't aware of. I think a lot of people think that mosses are generally found in kind of shady and moist places. What is the range of mosses in the UK? Is that true to say? It's true and it's not true. So the range of mosses they're almost universal. So you can find mosses in almost any sort of habitat. They tend to be most diverse and they tend to outcompete other plants or they tend to be able to find a wider range of niches in permanently moist, damp habitats. And that's because of the relationship with water that I was talking about earlier, because they're, they're requiring to get their water and nutrients over the surface of the plant rather than taking it up from the soil, from roots and storing it in the plant. And this basically means that they're at the mercy of the environment. So if the environment's dry, they'll dry out. They'll survive in the dry state, but they won't be actually photosynthesized and they won't be metabolically active. So that means they do best in moist habitats. At the same time, they can also survive in very dry habitats. They're just not doing very much most of the time. So even in deserts, you'll get some mosses which are surviving on, on maybe sort of shaded bits underneath rocks. And most of the time, they might not be doing very much, but when it is moist they'll then take advantage of that and become metabolically active again so they're very flexible in that respect but it's certainly the case that the greatest diversity of mosses in the world and also in particularly in britain is in places which are continually moist so places where you have a large number of wet days per year simply because that enables the mosses to thrive most of the time whereas when it's not wet they're perhaps not able to do very much Obviously, people quite often find them in the lawn. They might find them on their roof. They may find them dotted around their garden. And I was wondering, in a garden setting, can they be cultivated? Is it something we could grow in a garden outdoors or even as a house plant? I'm not a horticulturist myself, but it, often it's just a case of leaving them alone. Often it's a case of not removing them deliberately. They will. I mean, in certain environments, other plants will outcompete them. So. If it's a kind of nutrient-rich environment and there's plenty of light, then perhaps grasses are going to be more favoured in relation to mosses. So if you wanted, you could pick out other plants that are competing and encroaching onto a clump of moss. It's going to be difficult probably to 
encourage mosses to thrive and to be dominant in the environment unless it is reasonably moist and shaded. But if you can see that mosses are already coming in to your lawn or to another place you have in your garden, then uh, you can encourage them just by pulling at other things that might be um, competing with them in that particular place. But you can cultivate briarflies. I mean, if you take a, a clump of moss and put it in, say, a, a Tupperware box and then put the lid on and then every now and again take the lid off and give it a little bit of water, don't flood it, just spray it a bit and so it's more or less continually moist. Every now and again, let it dry out. You can often have it living there for quite a long time. It doesn't need soil. It's best if it's attached to a rock or something like that, then take the rock and put it somewhere where it's um, sort of equivalent situation to the place that you got it in the wild. And people have managed to keep mosses growing um, either in plastic boxes or perhaps just on rocks or in the substrate that initially growing on in their houses or perhaps on, on windowsills for really quite long periods of time. They can be quite fussy, though. So every individual species of moss will have its own requirements in terms of levels of light and moisture. So it's, it can be quite difficult to get that right. So it's really just a case of paying attention to what it's looking like. If it looks like it's looking a bit kind of dried out and happy, then maybe put it in a, a more shaded place, give it a bit more water. But yes, um, it's an emerging activity, I think, cultivating bryophytes, but it's uh, it's very much at its early stages yeah, I think probably they do it overseas better. But yeah, it's a really interesting area. But thinking of developing areas in gardens, uh, there's also a lot of interest at the moment in gardens that are created from waste products such as unwanted aggregates and also in gardens on brownfield sites. And I wondered, you mentioned something in your book about mosses that can find homes in similar conditions. And I was thinking as well about their potential to thrive in conditions where there's things like heavy metals, for example. So could you talk about those kind of mosses, maybe? Yeah, so I mean, there are a suite of mosses that we call sort of heavy metal mosses. And there's something called Ditricum plumbicola, which is actually very rare in Britain, but it grows on mine sites where lead was once mined, and there's extremely high concentrations of lead in the soil. Other mosses which grow on, on copper contaminated soil. And most of these extreme heavy metal mosses are quite rare because they actually require quite high levels of um, metalliferous pollution of a specific type in the soil. But there are many mosses and other bryophytes which will happily grow in places that other plants can't. So with other plants, there are some plants that like certain conditions, other plants that like, like other conditions. There are some mosses that will like and be able to tolerate pretty much whatever conditions that you will find. And they have the advantage that because they don't have roots, they're generally not requiring soil. So they're great colonizers. So if you have, a, say, a brownfield site and there's initially no vegetation there, mosses and other bryophytes will be some of the first plants that will move in and start to grow even on things like concrete and rubble and maybe sort of very nutrient poor soil. And by doing that, they're getting their nutrients and their moisture from the air and from sort of incident water more often than not. So they'll be then starting to create soil in that environment, which then other plants later on can use when they move in. So mosses and bryophytes have, um, I think, a really important role as, uh, as, as colonizing plants for any disturbed habitat, but uh, including disturbed habitats which are created by us. That, again, I suppose, moves over into the environmental importance of mosses. And one of those things that you mentioned in the book is their importance, I think, in terms of water attenuation and conservation. But I was thinking as well, could you just perhaps talk a little bit about how they provide a, a habitat for other creatures? Because I think maybe people don't naturally think of mosses as being a habitat for other living things. Well, it's really just because, again, it comes down to scale, because mosses and other bryophytes are, are small plants. So, of course, they're providing habitats for other things to live. But these are other things that are also very small. So just as if you, if you go into a, a forest, then the animals are smaller than the plants in many cases. So if you go into a, a clump of moss, the animals inside that clump of moss are going to be very small and difficult to see. But if you put a, a clump of moss under a dissecting microscope or, um, or a compound microscope and, and look closely, you'll find that it's teeming with all sorts of little microscopic creatures, and some of which are maybe not so microscopic, things like uh, nematodes and small spiders and beetles. But in particular, things like tardigrades and rotifers are very abundant in, in moss. So these are amazing. Uh, so in the case of tardigrades, they're a, a bit similar to arthropods. They're sort of one of the, the lineages of, of animals that split off 
maybe just before arthropods started to evolve. They're often called water bears or water piglets. So they're tiny, they're, they're multicellular, but they don't have all that many cells. And they have several legs which have claws on them and they feed on microscopy algae and, and they're basically grazing in clumps of mosses in the same way that larger animals might graze on, on grasslands. So yes, there's a huge diversity. Mites is another thing which are very diverse in moss. So these things we call orobatid mites, armoured mites that are related to spiders, but they're, they're considered to be smaller. And then springtails, another one there, uh, again, a, a type of arthropod, and they're called springtails because they have this uh, almost sort of a mousetrap-like spring device which enables them to jump large distances. So there's a, a huge diversity of quite often quite surprising animals that you'll find in moss if you just look a bit more closely. And also, I think, again, on the environmental side and the habitat side, gardening has kind of played a part in the destruction, sadly, of the sphagnum bogs in terms of extracting stuff for compost. And I thought it was really interesting what you said about how those bogs can be a potential positive feedback loop for climate change. And I wondered if you could explain that. And again, we're phasing peat out, but is there anything else that can be done to conserve these habitats? Yeah, so it's, it's really difficult to overemphasize the importance of sphagnum bogs, of peat bogs in Scotland and Ireland, in particular, and other parts of the northern temperate areas. So sphagnum is an amazing plant. So sphagnum is a type of moss, and it's the dominant plant on bogs. And basically because the cell structure of a sphagnum leaf it's basically able to absorb huge amounts of water in relation to its volume. So some of the cells in a sphagnum leaf are basically empty. So they're basically acting like almost, if you like, water bottles to absorb water from the environment and keep it within the plant. And this means that sphagnum moss is able to keep the surface of a bog permanently moist. This inhibits decomposition. It also keeps it acidic, which also is acting to inhibit decomposition. And this enables peat to gradually build up over hundreds of thousands of years. So peat is basically undecomposed, unrotted, if you like, sphagnum moss, which has accumulated over hundreds of thousands of years. And as a result, it's keeping carbon because undecomposed organic matter is basically carbon compounds. It's keeping that carbon in the soil and preventing it being released into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide, which would happen if it decomposed. So it's, I think it's estimated that roughly 20% of the carbon stored in terrestrial natural environments is actually in the form of peat or in, in, in peat bogs. So it's an incredibly important carbon sink. And the worry is that this is where the positive feedback thing comes in. If sphagnum bogs get degraded, if you remove that top surface layer of the sphagnum, which is keeping it moist, or if climate warming dries out that top surface layer, then decomposition will start happening. And then the peat, which has accumulated for hundreds of years, will start to decompose and release that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And of course, the, the warmer the atmosphere gets, the drier the habitat potentially gets and the more carbon that's released. So it's a, one of the, the many potential runaway feedback loops that we can get from climate change. So this is why it's very important to maintain and conserve our sphagnum bogs, and particularly this living layer of living sphagnum moss we have on the, the top surface, which is keeping everything else in there, if you like. And obviously they're incredibly important, but I think, intriguingly, there's a link between them and the moon, is there? Yeah, well, it's just, just a paper that was published um, a few years ago, which I found rather fascinating. I mean, all plants, they have rhythms which are, are related to cycles in the environment, obviously. So, I mean, the most obvious one is between summer and winter. So so most plants will grow more vigorously in summer. And, and that's the case for, for most mosses as well. But there was a very interesting study done a few years ago by a, a researcher called Viktor Mironov. And he showed that there are various rhythms of growth in sphagnum one of which actually is related to, to lunar cycles. So it appears that the sphagnum moss will grow more vigorously when there's basically no moon, when there's a new moon, and it will grow least vigorously when there's a full moon. And this is thought to be because moonlight is actually inhibiting the growth of the sphagnum moss on the bog. And it's interesting to think why this would have evolved. So why would the, the sphagnum moss want to coordinate its growth according to the lunar cycle? And it's probably simply because the lunar cycle provides a, a rhythm which the sphagnum moss can use to make sure that the, all of the, the sphagnum plants in a bog are growing at the same rate and are coordinated with each other in terms of their growth. Because if you think about what I was saying earlier about this living layer of sphagnum moss on top of 
a peat bog, one reason it's able to keep all that moisture in, it's like a big wet blanket, if you like, is because the surface layer is all at the same level. If you imagine that all the sphagnum mosses were growing at different rates, then you wouldn't have that nice uniform blanket of sphagnum over the top of the bog. So it's thought that the sphagnum is using the moon as a sort of cue, as a sort of external clock, if you like, that it can use to coordinate the growth of the individual sphagnum plants to maintain this uniform wet blanket over the surface of the bog. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I think counter to what you might expect, if you're thinking about plants and sunlight, and you kind of might assume that it was going to grow more in, in the moonlight. But I do, yeah, intriguing stuff. So... The other thing that I have to ask you before I let you go is obviously the book is about bryophytes and that includes the liverworts. And I think anyone who's grown plants in pots might find some of these appearing on the surface of the compost. And I know a lot of people will be tempted to weed those out because I think the theory could be that they're competing with the plant that is wanted for nutrients and for moisture. Is that the case then, if they don't have these traditional roots and they're not taking stuff from the soil? Should we not be so worried about weeding them out? I think you should be leaving them alone, personally. Obviously, I'm biased as a biologist. So I haven't really talked very much about liverworts and homeworts. So, so when you're seeing moss, they look green and leafy, so they have stems and leaves. Many liverworts also look like that as well. They have stems and, and leaves. Other liverworts are what we call phalloid. So this is possibly the sort of liverwort that you're seeing growing in your plant pots. It almost looks like a kind of scaly snakeskin, sort of flat plate-like structure that's growing over the surface of the soil in the pot. Uh, hornworts are similar. They have a similar type of growth form, but they're much rarer and you're quite unlikely to see them. But yeah, if, if you think about what I was saying earlier about the way that mosses and other bryophytes, including liverworts, are getting their water and nutrients, they're just getting it over the surface of the plant. They don't have roots. They have things called rhizoids, which just anchor them to the surface. So they're not pulling up water and nutrients from the soil from deep inside the pot where the plant that you're, you're trying to grow is getting its nutrients and water. So they're not competing at all in really in that sense. And in some cases, because they're absorbing water and nutrients from the atmosphere, they may be in a small way contributing, sucking, if you like, water and nutrients or nutrients in particular into the, the soil and to some extent replenishing it. But really, if you think about the scale of the liverwort compared to the, the size of the plant you're growing in the pot, it's really not going to be competing very much in terms of water and nutrients. And to the extent it is, it's also contributing in ways that the other plant isn't. So really, I wouldn't worry about it at all. I mean, there's a, maybe a mechanical aspect to it, which could either be beneficial or, or non-beneficial in the sense that it's forming this mechanical layer of the top of the soil, which may be to some extent keeping water in, but also maybe it might mean you have to be careful when you're watering that the water is actually getting into the pot. But, but really, liverworts are not going to be doing anything to the soil or to the plant, which is going to be damaging for it. And in some senses, if you allow liverworts to grow on the, the soil, it's perhaps mimicking the natural environment that the plant would have if it was growing in the wild. Well, that is good to know because they look lovely and I'm happy to leave them. Good stuff. So thank you for the book. It is lovely and it does a really good job of bringing moss to a wider audience. And before I let you go, I just did want to mention the photography in the book because it is amazing. The photography is mostly by Des Callahan. So Des Callahan is, is, is a biologist and he's an expert biologist and he's also an expert photographer. And uh, there are very few people in the world in whom these two skills come together in a really synergetic way and I would almost say he's unique he's possibly the best bi-fi photographer in the world at the moment and with the advent of digital photography of course it's become a bit easier to photograph these small things so over the past five or ten years particularly from from Des we've just seen this explosion of just amazing images of mosses and other other bri fights which is really brilliant because it, it, it brings this difficult to see world out into the public sphere and makes people aware of it which is is really invaluable if i can just make another plug it's really just not so much for an individual but really just for the importance of mosses and other bryophytes particularly liverworts in a british context so i talked earlier about the the distribution of, of bryophytes but actually in britain we have something like five percent of the bryophytes in the world actually grow in britain this compares to something like 0.5% of our vascular plants. So we really have a, an internationally important bryophyte flora, particularly in the west of Britain, where we have this oceanic climate, which really needs to be, to be understood and conserved. So that's another thing that I hope that people will get out of the book. And if they did want to get more involved in protecting these plants or habitats, how could they do that? 
is strange. Some of the, the threats to our most interesting bryophyte habitats in Britain are, are perhaps unexpected. Things like Rhododendron ponticum is a nightmare in, uh, in, in the west of Britain where it, it chokes shaded stream valleys and basically shades out uh, bryophytes. And there's not much to be done about it. It's a very aggressive plant, unfortunately. Obviously, just finding out more about bryophytes, being aware of them. The more people are aware of them, then the more that these views are taken into account when people are trying to conserve habitats. So there is a society called the British Bryological Society, which which I'm involved in, and that's the society in Britain where it's asked to understand, record, understand and conserve mosses, liverworts and hornworts. So I'd encourage anyone that's interested in bryophytes in Britain to join the BBS. Uh, they have a website you can find if you Google British Biological Society and really just be an advocate for these plants because the, the biggest threat in some ways that bryophytes face is that people just aren't aware of them and, and don't think about them when they're thinking about conserving habitats. But in many cases, conserving Bryophyte is about conserving habitats. It's about just looking after the natural habitats we have, Atlantic oak woodlands, certain types of wet heath in the, the west of Britain. So it's generally about habitat conservation more than perhaps species conservation and, and really just encouraging people to be aware of that and to, to campaign for preservation of natural habitats in this country. Very well said. Thank you very much to Neil for the interview and for opening up the world of mosses to more people. Thanks to you for listening. I hope this episode has sparked an interest in bryophytes for you, if you weren't already captivated by them. Now Dr Ian Bedford is up, with more information on a particular moss dweller. We only have to look around our gardens to realise that there's a vast and diverse array of creatures that live alongside us, and that their basic requirements for survival are usually very similar to ours. However, during recent years, organisms have been discovered that were very different because they were surviving in environments that would be lethal for all other known life forms on Earth. Discovering these organisms was not only surprising, but of great interest and value to modern day science. From heat and pressure resistant bacteria discovered in hot volcanic vents deep under the oceans, to rock algae growing in the coldest regions of Antarctica, these organisms thrived. And so, not surprisingly, they were called extremophiles. And quite incredibly, one of these extremophiles is a tiny group of invertebrates, closely related to insects, that are called the tardigrades. Tardigrades are less than a millimetre in length, sausage shapes and have four pairs of stumpy clawed legs and a large round mouth that they use to vacuum up microscopic prey into their almost transparent bodies. And now that we know about tardigrades, the more we look, the more species are found from virtually anywhere around the world, with over a thousand having been recorded so far, from hot springs in America to the top of the Himalayas, and from the sediment at the bottom of the deepest oceans to within layers of polar ice. And also in ponds, meadows, and even in our gardens here in Britain, where they can be found living within moss and algae. But what makes tardigrades an extremophile is their ability to survive extreme conditions by using a biological process that hasn't been seen before in any other organism. They're able to change the water in their bodies into a sugar that preserves them during periods of extreme cold and drought. And the effectiveness of this process was demonstrated by tardigrades that were found to have survived for over a hundred years amongst museum material. And more recently by tardigrades that survived a 12-day experiment within the cold vacuum of outer space. In fact, continued research into the lives of these tiny creatures has discovered that some species can withstand temperatures down to minus 272 Celsius and up to 150 degrees Celsius, while others survived atmospheric pressures six times greater than those found in the deepest oceanic trenches, and others were unaffected by radiation levels hundreds of times higher than the lethal dose for humans. And so, consequently, it's been suggested that tardigrades are likely to live through a complete global mass extinction event and would therefore supersede the cockroach's reputation as the ultimate survivor by a very wide margin. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon 
where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast. 